Oh, good morning. Welcome to the Shia this evening, Chalamet Sukkis. I'd like to dedicate this Shia for the Rafur uh, Shleimo, for a young boy who uh, was involved in a road accident. His name is Mendel Ben Leia. Let's go to our first question now. I know it's really past Jim Kippur, but because several people asked me this question, therefore I felt a uh, good idea to address it. And that is about preparing food on Yom Kippur. So several people asked this question about taking food out of the freezer, uh, cutting up, putting on the tables, etc. Then one variation of this is whether you can use um, the services of a goy. So let's go. So this is just for educational purpose, I'll be the next team keeper. Um, so I'll have to refresh on that. But here we have a din in the Gemara, the concept of knivas yerek, of, of trimming and cutting up vegetables. And this was permitted, although normally hachona mikodesh l'choyl isn't allowed, but we do have an exception here. That on Yom Kippur, in order to minimize the agmas nefesh, the uh, discomfort, etc., of people having to wait until the food is ready. So in this man Hagemore, it was permitted to chop vegetables of sorts, to trim them, and to crack nuts. So you have for Motsi Yom Kippur. So here we have, however, that Achsho, the Altarebbe, this is in Simon Tofresh, Yud Aleph, that nowadays is become customary to forbid the preparing of vegetables, etc. Um, other preparations of food, even after Mincha, because in later generations, people started preparing earlier on in the day, and the Heter and the Gemara is only after Mincha, and therefore it became, it was banned totally. So that's the way it remains in the Minig in Shulchan Aruch, that there is no preparation of food on Yom Kippur for Motsu Yom Kippur. Yet I see here in the Nite Gavriel that he writes that you would be allowed to touch food is not muksa Yom Kippur, and therefore to take food out of the fridge that they should be ready for night after nightfall. He says that is okay. He permits it. Um, fine. So whereas cutting up would not be allowed. That's more engaging, if that's the right word. But if it's just moving it from A to B, that's okay. Now, the other point, point two in my list, is about taking food out of the freezer on day one of Yom Tov for day two of Yom Tov. In other words, Yom Tov is going to be Monday and Tuesday. So to take out food on Shmini Atzeres afternoon, to take it out from the freezer, that should be defrosted by Tuesday, uh, by Tuesday night. So, I've looked into this um, a while ago, and my, my feeling is that it is permitted. And the reason is that when you remove it, it's, it doesn't actually become ready in the moment you remove it from the freezer. You take it out, and then it's going, to de it's going to become ready by defrosting, and that's going to happen by itself, so to speak. So the act of removing it from the freezer is not considered a hachon in itself. The fact that later of course, it's going to defrost by itself, but that's happening by itself, and therefore that's the basis of the heter, if necessary, to take food out of the freezer to defrost until nightfall. Of course, if you're going to defrost it earlier, that you can have some of it before sunset, of course that is more and more glad, but even if that's not possible, for whatever reason or not practical, it's all very well to take out one kugel for, one, for a family. If you have a campus and you've got 50, 60 students, you've got a whole bunch of kugelach, and you can't start saying, oh, I have two pieces of and a bite of each kugel. That doesn't not be very practical. Okay, let's go on to the next question. And that is um, also a Yom Kippur, a Yom Kippur Shaila. Um, Shliach called me on uh, the day after Yom Kippur that at Kol Nidre, one of the Sifritaira slipped to the floor. And as would be the reaction in any from community, in any, in any, uh, any so, so, so the, the people are upset and, and what, what do we have to fast, etc. The interesting thing is that because you've got a Yom Kippur, 
you're going into a fast. So does the fast of Yom Kippur count for the fast, which is a tikkun for the kahila, for the Sefer Torah where that fell? So what we have here on the screen, you have here um, from the, this is in Hichas, uh, in Hichas Shabbos, I think it's Simon Reish Peiches, which talks about Tanis Chaloi. And if a person had a dream which is so worrying that warrants them to fast, so they would fast the following day. So now in the Mishnah Brura there, he addresses what happens if Sunday is in any case to fast. So do you have to, so, so Sunday's on Shivasa Batamus. Does the person have to fast? Um, in other words, all right, let's um, recap. Um, if a person fasts the Tanis Chaloim on Shabbos, he has to fast another day to rectify having fasted on Shabbos. So the question is, that fast for rectifying? If it happens to be the following day, is this a fast in any case? Does it count or not? So the first opinion quoted the Mishnah Bureau says it doesn't count because he was going to fast in any case. But yes, and the others disagree, and they say a fast which is um, a tanus choiva, which is which is incumbent in any case, it still counts. And they should have in mind that that fast is also going to be an atonement for having fasted on Shabbos. And Mr. Bura Rasamza, Misha Koshaloi Hatan, so you can rely, if necessary, you can rely on the Tanis Tzibur to double up, so to speak, for the Chiva fasting because of the, the uh, there's a Tanis Um Before I saw this in the Mishtabur, I saw in another Sefer called the Sefer Meir Oiz, looking around. Um, and here, here's a, get a little bit more interesting because it's not just a fast. Yom Kippur is, is, is a day of atonement. It's a So there are those who take the view that um, the itzumer shalyoyim mechaper that because it's Yom Kippur, um, that in itself is enough that you shouldn't have to fast. So here we have two views on that. Okay. Um, so, but there is certainly a learned, a lenient view here. And then, as I was browsing looking for something else, I saw that Nita Gavriel on Yom Kippur. On the volume on Yom Kippur also addresses this. Uh, he has an interview here with some a bit more detail. And he says, if a Sefer fell on Yom Kippur, so the person who actually dropped it, that he should be fasting after Yom Kippur, the rest of the people who were present are, are exempt. They don't have to fast. So he's relying on the lenient opinions. Some say they should fast, etc. So here we have, I think, a bit of a balance that the one who actually drop the Sefer Torah, who is complicit, so to speak, in the dropping of the Sefer Torah, should um, fast after Yom Kippur, choose a day. But the rest of the people, we've got ample um, basis to say that they don't have to fast because they're fasting Yom Kippur in any case. Okay, let's go on to Sukkot. And here, the question I was asked about was, if a goy puts up the schach, is the sukkah valid? Now, on the screen, you've got Simon Tofresh Lamed Vov, which talks about a sukkah, which is a sukkah yoshono. It's more than 30. It was built uh, a, long, a long while ago. And there's a whole business of lechadish to kind of do something, add a bit of schach or something to kind of rejuvenate it, the covered the Yom Tov. The previous simon, Tofresh Lamed Hay, talks about Sukkas Ganvach Rakvash. Ganvach stands for Goyim Noshim, um, the Burgin, I think, and then Kusim. So there it says, Sukkas Ganvach is Kosher. If a Goy builds a Sukkah, it's Kosher. So then Mr. Bua says, just like a Sukkah Yashono, um, one should do a a chidush, ma'aseh chidush. So the same thing, sukkas hanochrim, also a hidur mitzvah, you should be mechadish, you should do something to rejuvenate. Now, now let's take a look. This is a quote from the Stei Chemed. And he writes the following. This is the Chemed in the volume of, when the, the section on sukkah. So he writes, if, he's quoting here from Rav Chaim Falaji, 
who was, I believe, in you know, one of the Rabonim in Turkey, a very a, a prominent Poisik, going back 150 years ago. Are you allowed to build a sukkah by a, by a goy? If a goy builds a sukkah without a yid present, pshit of the psula. The Prime Falai says, obviously it's possible. Well, one has to know if the if you if you tell a goy she worker to do it for you, then that's I'm, I'm not sure about. On this, the Stei Chemed, who lived not long after him, uh, he writes, I don't understand what he's saying. Look at Tofri Shlambadhei, that Sukkah Sa'akum Kishela. Even if, if a goyim builds a Sukkah, he builds it as a shelter. So it's kosher. You don't need to have a id there present. So what's this business? If a goyim makes a Sukkah, it's possible. And I saw also in uh, the Dirshu Mishtaburi quoting from Rabbi Yashiv, saying that a Sukkah um, placed by a goy is possible. And again, the question, why? Now, possibly, the view, the, the, it is imperative that the sukkah is built as a shelter, not as a roof which is waterproof, not just for privacy, but as a shelter, a shelter from, from the sun, etc. When a goy builds a somewhere in the, you know, in the countryside, he builds a shelter, and you happen to be in sukkahs taking a, 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 a hike, and then you see this shelter which the goy built, yeah. That sukkah was built as a, as a, as a, as a cell, as a, a shelter. That's fine. But if a goy builds a sukkah not for a shelter, well, then we have a question: Is that is, it, is that valid? That's that's I, I think where they these postmen are coming. A goy puts up a sukkah, and he doesn't know that it's for a shelter. He just the, the Jewish employer needs this this thing, and this he doesn't know what what it's for. He doesn't understand. So then they're saying well, it's, it's possible. Now, having said that, I have a problem with that Khumra, because I would say that if you go around the shul and ask people, why do you build a sukkah? They'll probably say, because that's a Jewish thing to do. They won't say it's for a shelter from the element, it's a shelter not from rain and shelter not from, they'll, they'll tell you it's a, it's a sukkah because it's a mitzvah to build a sukkah. They don't think that the sukkah is for a shelter. So why should it be if a goy builds a sukkah, the shame shell, the shame sukkah? He's doing it because the yid wants a sukkah. At any rate, um, so the pashtas, it seems to be that if a goy is employed by you to build to put up schach, the schach is kosher, um, not worse than if he had um, built a shelter on his own. Uh, and then there's a mile to make a chiddush to make to do some kind of adjustment. And that's that's not a major a major change. There's a little bit of he talks there about a tefach or tefach of schach, something a little bit of a addition, adding a bit of schach to the goy's sukkah to the goy's schach, and that's adequate. That's that's been our din, of course. The chotchila we we do it ourselves, and uh, fine. Let's move on. Now oh, someone's asked here. Someone's asking if someone didn't fast on Tanis Esther. For example, a chosun, should he make up the, the fast which he's missed? Can he use a tan is choivo to make up? So he's getting married on tan is Esther, I presume you're, you're talking about. And he didn't fast. The Moshe Chosun gets married on, uh, on Rosh Chodesh. He doesn't fast. So there the minig is to fast a, a, a day in advance. So you're asking what would be if the day in advance would be a time, so let's say he's getting married on um, Yud Aleph, Yud Beis Tevis. No, but then he's no, 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 no. if it's a Rosh Chodesh, I don't have to get, get, get the facts right. How could it be this Shiloh? Yeah. When would there be a time of Shreva? In marriage on the 11th. Yes, but uh, but why didn't you fast? Why, why isn't there fast on the, on the day of the Hasana? Okay, let's leave it for another time because uh, I didn't prepare for that and might get it wrong, so I guess. Okay, um, so on Erev Yom Tov, one of uh, my contacts asks me, what's the minig? When you make Kiddush and you say, does the family also say, 
Do they st- are they yotze with your leisha vasukha at Kiddush, or do they make their own leisha vasukha? So this has been circulated uh, on various uh, madrichim, etc., um, English, Hebrew, and this is from this is from there's a sefer called Halochoy Sumin Hoge Chabad. I'm just going to show it to you on the screen. Halochoy Sumin Hoge Chabad. This is basically taken from the um, his Kashrus journal, which comes out every week. But they, so it has a section called Luach Hashavua, was compiled primarily by Rabbi Yossi Ginsburg from Omer, and he writes this. Or it's this. This is from that sefer. So whereas the one who makes Kiddush says Leishi Vasuka right after Kiddush, but the rest of those who are present will make their own Brocha Leishi Vasuka after Hamotzi. I never saw that at home. Um, I've never noticed that. Though. There should be a point that everyone should make their own um, their own uh, Leishi Vasuka. The Yotzer with the Kiddush, the Yotzer also from uh, with the Leisha Vasukha. Um, let's, let, let's discuss this a little bit. So here, the quote which we have at the bottom on the left of the page is from the Sefer Mate Moshe, it's a Talmud of Marshall, so it's putting about, about 400 years ago plus. Um, Leisha Vasukha said on the Rechem Bechayim base, so he's saying that Leisha Vasukha has said, be, be, uh, at Kiddush, be, before, um, before you start eating. Now, a couple of points here. Number one, I take exception to people establishing a minig Chabad without having a source in Sifrei Chabad. Minig Chabad is established by the Rabbeim. If you have a Hachro, one way or the other, you're entitled to make your Hachro, your, your, your uh, evaluation, but to say that this is a Minik Chabad, well, where's your source in, in Minik Chabad? That, that is indeed the way to decide. Fine. Um, I saw in Rabbi Broin's um, manual, so he writes that he has also taken this view and he's addressed it at uh, some kind of story and in, it will be published in his forthcoming Sefer, I guess, called Astra the Rab. Fine. I, have, I didn't manage to read it, but let's just read the notes here. 353. The Minogeno, the one who makes Kiddush, says Leisha Vasukha at Kiddush. That's because he's drinking the wine, and the wine is a Kvias. And that's why we also make uh, Leisha Vasukha at, at Kiddush by day um, at, at, with the wine. But the other people, they're not drinking so much wine. I don't know. That, that's their argument. I don't know how much wine you have to drink to be Yotza for Kiddush. You, you, enough. you don't have to have a revious yai. So I don't see that being a compelling argument. Um, what I do know is that there, there is a mila in saying Leisha Vasukha before you start eating. That's the Shita Sarambam that you should say Leisha Vasukha before you start. So there is a mile, although that's not our minig when you're, when you're not making Kiddush. So we say Leisha Vasukha after Hamoitzi, but there is a mile in Eval to say Leisha Vasukha before you sit down. So when we say Leisha Vasukha before sitting down, we've been going to the other Shita also. Um, my other concern is, is that sometimes you've got, especially the Ezras Noshim, which are going in and out of the sukkah, they're having a little bit in and out. Do they, will they have a, a, sh- a shear of a kabeya of the oid to be yotzer, the mitzvah of leisha of, sukkah, of, 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 to justify their bracha? If they're not going to, it's, or it's a little bit not so sh- clear, it may be better for them to be yotzer the leisha of sukkah, one of sure. If they will stay on in the sukkah enough time to have a, a, a kabeya of oid within the time frame of bread, then there's a fine, there's a vinyotza. If they don't, so they didn't, there's no question of brach levatola because they didn't say brach, they were just yotza from someone else. So I'm not so hot on this hachroa that the rest of the family should have to make their own leshava sukkah. I can see there's merits in that, but I can see also merits in the way um, I saw at home is that 
with the father makes the Kiddush and Leishav Asukah and everyone else is Yaitse, as far as I remember. Yeah. Let's move on. So here, out of Sukhis, I get a question, a photograph with a uh, So the sukkah, the, the, sorry, the estrig has a stalk. And the stalk is where it's connected to the tree. The estrig tree is more like a bush than a tree, but fine. And the stalk fell off. So is the estrig kosher? So here we look at, uh, this is from Tofresh Mem uh, Ches, Simin, about estrig, where it says if the ukits, if the stalk fell off, um, then if it leaves now a recess or uh, whatever into the asterisk, Misha Gumo be asterisk, so the asterisk is called asterisk chosa. So then that would make the asterisk possible. But yes, machshirim. Some say no, the ukut is not the asterisk proper. It's extra to the asterisk. And even if there is a recess over here, that does not invalidate the asterisk. It's only if the flesh of the asterisk proper is missing. The haloch is not like the, the lenient opinion. The haloch is like the first opinion, that if the, the ukutz is missing, it is um, possible. Then you could use such an esrug and make a brocha. Um, okay. Now, I looked also into a possibility of using a bit of glue and gluing the stalk back into place. So some say yes, some say no. So you still don't get, get a, a, a clear consensus whether gluing is going to solve your problem. All right, so I told him better not to use it on the first day. First day, second day, it's also. For the rest of Sukkot, so here you have a rule as far as psulim, between what's the difference between the first day or days and the rest of Sukkot. There is a posture called a kachtem lochem. And from this we learn the kichotamo, that this esrik should be intact. That applies only to the first day. The dinim, which are got to do with hidur, and lacking of hidur, that applies to the whole of sukkahs. So each disqualification of the esrik, we're going to have to uh, decide what is this psalm. Is it because of tamimus or is it because of hidur? If it's because of, so let's read inside. Other psulim is disqualify first day, the rest of this. If it's possible because it's missing a piece, like a hole or a bit of um, um, a hole through the asterisk, a piece, a chunk missing from the asterisk. Or if there's a recess because the ukus has been pulled out. That is a problem only of Tmimus, and that's kosher for the rest of Sukkot. The pitum, by contrast, the missing pitum is not only a problem of, of um, missing something, but also it's lacking of lacking hidur. Therefore, a lost pitum would be a psul for the whole of Sukkot, um, whereas the missing ukut is only possible in the first days. I'm not going to go into the whole discussion about the how much of the pitum chopped off would be uh, invalidating the asterisk, but that's another discussion. Not every bit of the pitum missing makes it a possible of Alma. Someone came to me today, actually, it was a young boy under Bar Mitzvah. His pitum was off. I told him he can make a brocha on it. And that's, that seems to be the Altarebis Psak, that you can make a brocha if uh, the, the uh, bit, at least, it's only, the, it's only the bit which is outside the asterisk is missing, but there's nothing missing for the asterisk proper, it's okay. Okay, um, in anticipation of this, this year, I had some questions from some shluchim who do not have a minion, not, don't anticipate a minion, or didn't have a minion, and three, two or three questions. One is about Kriyas Hatayla. So Kriyas, when there's no minion, so here we have a halocha. This is from the Sefer Tanya Rabsi, which is also quoted in the Morgan Avram, I believe, in the beginning of Simon Kuf Ben Gimel, that if you don't have a minion, then it's a minic to read from a chumash without brachas. 
neither before or after. That's when there's no chumrah, no, no Sefer Torah. If you want, I believe, if you want to take out a Sefer Torah to do the same, I don't see a problem with that. So some shluchim don't have a minion and do have a Sefer Torah, some don't have either. But you can you can do, and it's, it's sorry, it's recommended that shaloytishtakach, the concept of Kriya Torah shouldn't be forgotten, that at the slot in Davening, where you would have done Kriya Torah, so you take a chumash and you read the relevant parsha. Here we have um, in the Kafachayim, he's quoting from the, I think from Shara Kriya Sagdoilo, Minig of Izmir, which I think this is in Turkey, when they would have to run away to the villages because of uh, a plague in town. And for some reason, they weren't able to take up Sefer Torah, but they had a minion out there, it looks like. They would read, the, the Chazan would read a parsha from the Chumash and also do the Haftar. So, yes, so when there's no minion, still recommended to do, go through the parsha and also the Haftar. Some Shluchim have told me that actually they find it very rewarding in the, because Chris Torah, you can't really explain. But if they have got a few Makuravim have come, not enough for a minion. So they'll go through the parsha and discuss it, and it can be very meaningful. I want, but I want to address this Indian of Haftoira. We have a minute Chabad that we, when it comes to Mabish Sedrish, now Mikra Vechatargum, so that we do the Haftoira when sometimes there's a the Haftoira of that week is pushed, pushed over, let's say when you've got two Sedras combined. So one Haftoira is recited, usually the latter one. And the other one is, is pushed aside, but in Mafim Bava said you'll do both. Similarly, if let's say it's Arba Parshis or whatever it may be, Shabbos or Shchodesh, so in Mava Sedra, we'll do also the Haftoy, which are not be, is not being read. Now, looking at Rebbe Shechonorach and Simeresh Pehei, you see here that really you don't have to do Mava Sedra, you don't have to do the Haftoy part of Mava Sedra, but the Minig is to do so just in case you're called up to the Torah. So then, if it's only because you might get called up, so then why do you have to read the Ham after which you're not going to get called up to? So the way I understand this is that the idea of Mava Sedra, if he wouldn't have Kriya Sedra, there'd be parts of the term which would be unfamiliar. So you have Kriya Sedra, you're familiar, you familiarize yourself. You build up your knowledge. Mava Sedra, so you memorize it, you, you go through it. Uh, so it helps you register. Similarly, there's a repertoire of Novi, which is important for us to know. So even if, for technical reasons, that Haftoira wasn't read this year, but it's still part of the repertoire which we should be familiar with, and therefore we should read it. And that seems, that's my understanding of why it's Minik Chabad to re read the Haftoira in Mav Sedra, to read the Haftoira, even though that's not going to be read that Shabbos is show. So coming back to the Shliach, who's in a place where he doesn't have a minion, or etc., but still, just like there's an Indian of reading the Torah, Shalaita Shtachach Torah's Kriya, well, similarly, the Haftoira is also something important. I'm not going to say it's the same, but it is something important. Okay, right. So let's go on now to our next question. They asked about um, and her shyness without a shul. How do you do her shyness at home? So again, we have here from Kafa Chaim, her shyness comes up in Simon Tofresh Samach and in Tofresh Samach Dalad. The second one's about her Shana um, Neither of them are in the Alter Rebbe's Shukhanorach, unfortunately. What we have here in front of us is from the Kafa Chaim. I think it's Afre Samach. And he, res he says the following. Those people who are not going to shul for, because of oinus, he says, if you just put a chair and go around a chair, that's, that's a nonsense, he says. But if someone is not able to go around the, uh, the bimmer in shul, if he puts a chair and he puts a safer tanach on the chair, so then that's one way of observing the hakofa, the mitzvah of hakofa. Mm -hmm. Then he says, that's the, mm -hmm. from an earlier source. Then he says, if you put a, uh, have a table, which is resembles, no, it's more than a chair, it's more like the, uh, the bimmer in shul. And, do you, and you go around the table where we, in, the, in the house, that's the way of observing the minig of our coffers. So really, I mean, it's actually very beautiful now, and I think about it, that um, 
the Shulchan is doim al mizbeach. I'm not going to do the whole Gemara um, based upon the Pasuk in Cheskel. The Shulchan is doim al mizbeach. The reason why we go around the Bima in Shul is in commemorating of the Minig in the Beis Hamikdash where they would go around the mizbeach. And just like the mizbeach is in the center of the yard in front of the Heichel, so too we have the Bima. It is the center of the shul, and so we go around the bimmer, um, which is the uh, equivalent, or so to say, the substitute, so to speak. Or it's a table, shulchan daim al mizbeach. It has the same thing. Yeah. So um, if you're not able to go to shul, and you go around the table, and you have, especially if you have a safer on the table, you are that's that's your uh, a good a good substitute for the minig of hakafis. Okay. Now we go on to. The minha. So also people are asking about doing gizker without a minion. You know what? In some younger shuls, there is never a minion for yizker, because most of the uh, people go out and for yizker there's less than a minion. Can you take out an asev? You don't have a minion. Can you take out a sefer Torah for yizker? I, I don't. If, if, if that's going to make uh, people uh, baruiked, I, I, I don't have a problem with that. Right now. Minik Chabad is not to say was it was it today or was it yesterday of um, not to say um, not to say Hishanus on Shabbos. Instead, on Sunday, before saying the Hishana of that day, you say the Hishana of yesterday. But you don't. We don't go around the bimmer uh, for the first uh, for the recital of yesterday. We just go around the bim for the recital of today. The question which comes up is that this year, Shabbos is the sixth day of Sukkot, and Sunday is a Shana Rabbi. you're saying all seven Hakafas, all six Hakafas in any case. So, what do you do, a Shana Rabbi? How do you compensate for yesterday? So, this I, I dug up from his Kashas from a few years ago. Same Kaviyas in Tofshin Pei, and he says that in Tofshin Nun Beis, which was the same as this year, same Kaviyas, that they noticed, some say that they noticed, that the Rebbe first read the Hishano of the sixth day, which is Adoma Me'ered, which is day six, and then afterwards he went to the um, Hishano of the Yom Aleph and um, continued with the Hakafa. So that's one way of doing it. of uh, Right. Um, let's move on. So someone asks me a question, can a manicurist work on Chalamed and can they take payment for it? I didn't fully understand the question. I, I would say that if the person is cutting nails, you don't cut nails on Chalamed unless, unless it's, um, you know, there are circus circumstances where you can have to cut nails. Normally, you don't cut nails in a chalamay. Then it says, what about putting on uh, makeup, uh, how you say, um, uh, lacquer, nail polish? Now, is a woman allowed to put on nail polish in chalamay? She's allowed to, yes. If she, if she wants to do it, she's allowed to. Yeah, it makes it. She feels simple. Okay. Are you allowed to charge for doing this service? So, I once had a, a little um, psak, psak in Yiddish. I don't know how you say it in English. Um, but I, I, I did uh, one chalamoid. I did about 10 hours editing work, which I would charge per hour, the invoice per hour. Then after these 10 hours, and then I thought, oh, hang on a second, am I allowed to charge for my time in chalamoid? And I came to the conclusion, no, that you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to charge for your time in chalamoid. So they, you know, someone else benefited from those uh, 10 hours without being invoiced. So you, one shouldn't be charging for time in Chalamoid unless there's, there's, uh, there's, there, there can be circumstances, let's say, um, they can't find someone to do it for free. And so then they, you're, allowed to, you're allowed to take a charge for your time. But normally one shouldn't be providing, charging for services provided in Chalamoid. I'm reading here from Rabbi Forkash is in Chalamet Kilchasen. 
he writes the following. There are those who say that the issue to charge to, um, to, to a wage is for things which are not not say Hamed. Although you're allowed to do it for yourself because they're not malacha, but you're not, not allowed to charge for that. But if it's um, then you are allowed to, to charge for it. The Moshe and Poskim say in Shasad Chak, you don't have, and you can't find anyone to do it for free, and it's necessary to do it on Chalamoid, then you are allowed to charge for it. All right, so, so again, if it is a Tzoyre Chalamoid, let's say this, this person, uh, this cosmetic uh, thing is a Tzoyre Chalamoid, you can't wait till after Yom Tov, and it has to be done by a uh, professional, all right, uh, that, that may, may be justification, that professional charging for our services. Um, people in my position don't understand why it's such an urgent thing to have to do, to do it in a professional way, you know, during Cholomboy, but, you know, that's, you know. Okay, let's go on. So here, here's a question. A Jew has been out of work, and now it's come his way a, an opportunity to work as a manager in a non-kosher um, in, in sales of non-kosher food. So is he allowed to do so? So we have a simon in Kufyudzai in Yeridea not to trade with Tvorim Hasurim if it's also in toilet. If it's food which is forbidden minatoria to eat, you're not allowed to the chatchila make a trade out of that. If I have, yeah, it comes incidental. Let's say you're catching fish and you also catch some lobsters, you're allowed to sell them. But the chatchila to trade in lobsters, you're not allowed to. Yeah. So now, what's the, is there a reason for this? Of course, there's a reason. Yeah. Is there is the reason because that a person a yid should not be making parnosa from tray for food? Or is it that in, when you're engaging with the tray for food, you might, by mistake, be tempted to, you might temp, be tempted to eat it. So these are two questions, two, two, two possibilities. So Marshall, is it allowed for a Jewish boy or girl to work in a, in a, in a, in a Goisha deli? It's not there, they're not, they're not trading, but the chashash, they might put some food in the mouth is very, very real. And the other way around, if you are really remote, you're just, uh, buying chaza from here and sending it to another place, and you don't even see it. So there's a whole discussion about this. with we are machmer on both sides. Whether it is trading, you are buying and selling, or you are actually um, on, on, the, on the shop floor, either way one should. Now, in this case of this question of being a manager, <clears throat> it really, the, the, he's not the owner. So then that, that side of it doesn't apply. The other side of it, is it in the kind of food which is open, you might sometimes put, take something in your mouth, then the answer would be not okay. But if it's packaged food, which is being uh, sold in packets, brought in uh, basically trade, but not, not uh, on, a, on a retail level, um, then that would be okay. There's a true vinegar smosh about this. Um, he takes that view that it's neither schoire and nor is it the shashi might eat from it, that would be okay. Um, the last question on the list, but I have another one which I want to share with you, and that is should a woman be removing her rings before washing their kovasa in the morning? So there are those who are a little bit lenient about this, but what we see in the Alta Rebbe's Siddha, he says that whatever is an impediment for Nitis Yudayim Lesuda is also uh, applies the same for Nitis Yudayim in the morning. It should be Koyach Keili and Koyach Odom and talk about touching the Keili. So does she have to sleep off her, if a woman does go to sleep with her rings, if she does want, if it's, you know, she could wash Negovasa with her rings on, but before she does the second Negovasa, which, uh, which she makes a bracha, just like she removes her rings before Natasha dying for a meal, she should also remove her rings before Natasha Negovasa, upon which she makes a bracha. Having said that, there are those 
Hoskim who say that the reason why you have to remove a ring is because when you're going to be making a dough, you'd remove the ring. Some women don't remove the rings even when they're making a dough. So there, there is room to be makal uh, not to remove the rings and say it's not a chatzitza altogether. Generally, we don't follow that, and especially, you know, it's a mikvah, etc. So generally, women do remove their rings for uh, Natyasi like they die on the Suda. So by the same token, they should remove them before Natyasi die in the morning when they're going to make a bracha thereafter. One last thing which I want to just as a bonus. Oh, so here we have a whole thing about, um, right. So someone asked me today about Hashina. And that is, if you read Hayyim Yoim, was it yesterday, it says that the minute, I think it's today perhaps, that we begin the circuit either by the letter Samach or by the letter Ayin. I don't know whether I remember mentioned this last week. I don't know. About why Samach or Ayin? No? Okay, I, I read a fascinating article, someone by the name of Remendel Reitzes, in, uh, he lives in Kiryat Gat, and he, he points to a Tzemach Tzedek in Eratayra, and he shows where the days of Tishrei until Shmini Atzeres are 22 22 days, and they correspond to the 22 day letters of the Aleph base. So as I said, Marcelic, if you count from, so the, the first day of Sukkot is going to correspond to the letter Samach. Samach stands for Sukkot, very nice. So if that's the case, then we've got a nice word here, that when do we start a shyness? On the first day of Sukkot. So therefore we start the circuit by the letter Samach. But if the first day of Sukkot is Shabbos, so when do we start circling with the Hashanahs? On the second day, on Yom Tazayin, which is corresponding to the letter Ayin. Okay, so that's why the, that's the background to the Min, that's his, his theory. That's why the Min Chabad is to start circling either by the letter Samach or by the letter Ayin. And of course, now we're going to start making a whole new shot that it depends what type of Kvius it is, whether you start by Samach or Ayin. Um, before you take this too seriously, um, in 770, they used to usually actually start by the letter Nun. And the simple reason was because it was such a big crowd, um, they needed to have a bit long, more to say to be able to finish it, to, to, you know, to, uh, to, to able to do the circuit while saying their shines. But that's not what, they, what I wanted to share with you today. The question was that in, in Hayom Yom, it says that Hoshano said before the phrase and after the phrase is only when the Chazan says aloud. So we say also, whatever. But the earlier part, but we don't say Hashayna twice, only the parts which are said aloud with the Chazan and is asking the reason for this. Now, on the left, you have here a quote from a sefer called Oitzim Meforsha Hashayna's. I, did, I saw it in the shop, it was about 500 pages, um, a commentary on their shyness. I didn't buy it because I've got it on the computer in any case. Um, but here he brings various minhogim about when to say Heshana twice, Heshana once. My theory is the following, and it's not written there. And that is that the Chazan would say Heshana, and the Tzibur would respond Heshana. And then he says, Shaino, the man, Chabereino, and everyone said, Hoi, Shano, because not everyone knew all the details by heart. So the Chazan would say aloud the phrase, and everyone else would join in, Hoi, Shano, like the Ramah says in Chus about Halal, the Indochanaki talks about, it, about how people would respond, the chorus. So possibly this is, this is my theory, that the, the, uh, the, the, the repeating Hoi, Shano at the end, is reminiscent of when the Tzibur would respond to the Chazan. The Chazan would prompt the Moshan or Laman, such and such, and they would say Hashan. And therefore, it makes perfect sense that Dafka, when the Chazan is leading the Tzibur going around uh, the Bima and Shano Laman um, for, for this, um, whatever it may be, uh, and, and then those we say Hashan twice. Whereas when it's not said aloud, each one on their own, then you just say Hashan once. The Abishas will help them. We should have uh, see we should be the see the Hishano, the full full Yeshua, and uh, again Mashiach Sadkeno. We should celebrate 
at the end of Chag HaSukhis, with Moshiach Tzedkenu, in Yerushalayim, 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 Yerushalayim,